Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Checking us out here at the World Union of Deists. Today, on Reason, Deism, and God, we're going to continue our discussion on the Declaration of Sinlessness and the Eleven Reasons. Now, last time we did the preamble, and this time, what we're going to do is we're going to go through and deal with the first four of the 11 reasons on the Declaration of Sinlessness. I will read those to you, and you can read along with me when you look at the screen. Whereas we have examined the claims of supposed supernatural revelations by various revelators. Whereas we have been diligent in our study of the various texts claimed to be divinely revealed. Whereas we have been diligent in our study of the scholarly apologetics by adherence to said texts. Whereas we have been diligent in our study of sacred textual criticisms by reputable literary scientists. Okay, first four of the Declaration of Sinlessness, 11 Reasons. So we're going to go through these and deal with them one by one. Actually, they're kind of all related to each other, if you've noticed that. We're dealing with the issue of the supposed revelation by someone. Let's get into this. Let's deal with the first two initially as we blend in the third and the fourth. Whereas we have examined the claims of supposed supernatural revelations by various revelators, whereas we have been diligent in our study of the various sacred texts claimed to be divinely revealed. Well, that was one of my favorite subjects in Bible school, and that was comparative religions. As a matter of fact, I still have, reaching over for it, my original textbook from oh, 40, 50 years ago, 1973. And that was a, uh, an edition called Man's Religions by Noss, published by Macmillan. And at that time, it was the fifth edition. And in this particular book, which really opened up my eyes, as to the reality of so many religions and how so many of the world's religions have influenced society and history and human existence, period. But what really stood out to me, and I remember, I've talked about this before, I was raised in a Pentecostal, Bible-believing, Bible-thumping Holy Ghost, tongue-talking, floor-rolling, jumping off the pew, uh, practicing for rapture type of upbringing. And for me to go to Bible school, and I'll give them credit, they actually had a, a secularly printed book about the comparisons between the religions, you know, about world religions. And, and that really surprised me because most of the time it was everything was written by Gospel Publishing House, you know, out of Springfield, Missouri. Because uh, I mentioned before, I grew up in the ass of God. Uh, oh, well, yes, I know. That sounds offensive. Okay, ASS period, short for assemblies. They like to use AG. They, they even had a memo that went out many, many years ago requesting that people not use ass of God as the abbreviation, but use AG or assembly, spell it out. But anyway, <laughs> that's, that's, another, that's another whole subject to, to deal with. I always like to call them AOG, 
you know, assemblies of God, Aog, because it, it sounded more, oh, I don't know, Philistine or, <laughs> you know, one of the evil tribes in the in Canaan and that the the glorified Israelites were supposed to be fighting against. So regardless of my personal issues with, with assemblies, I have to say this much, at least the class dealt with these issues of, you know, what are the world's religions? What are the main ones that have influenced mankind? And you have several religions that really have been the major influences in our lives, our history, our our culture. Whether they've been a good influence or not, I think we can easily dispose of, of those issues once we start to get into talking about the religions. Now, let's deal with the religions that have been studied, and I have personal knowledge of learning about them and reading about them. And we're dealing with the issue of the supposed divine revealed sacred texts. And I'm going to list a few of them for you so that you get the idea of what is available for you on your own to study if you so choose to do it. All right? Now, of course, the Bible. We'll start off with, with the Bible. The Bible is readily available in multiple translations, in multiple versions, with or without the Apocrypha, the books that the Roman Catholic Church have included, that the Protestant Church have left out. You also have multiple other books that are considered possibly to be just as divinely inspired, but for whatever political and religious reasons, they weren't included. And those books are also available. Sometimes they're called the Gnostic Gospels or the Hidden Gospels. There's a whole bunch of different uh, variations on these these books that should be or could be there, but often are not. Christian Bible something, as I mentioned before, I've been raised with. I studied it intensively. In fact, my wife likes to say that he studied himself into unbelief. <laughs> and in essence, that's true. Once you really get into something and you start to dissect it and you start to, to, to recognize where it came from, and when you start to apply literary science to it, in other words, the uh, hermeneutics, Hermeneutics is is the understanding of the text in its time frame with with everything around about it culturally at the time. And when you look at the standard Bible and its sixty six books, realize we're we're talking about a, a period of thousands of years, uh, and that's a collection of different stories. And and what most people don't realize is that the Bible itself has been constantly edited and artificially put together in a particular order. And the question really comes with this is that who who did the editing and why and, and by what authority? And of course the groups, they all justify this with some divine inspiration nonsense. They will also, you look at the Bible and the Bible situation. I mean, there's plenty of material out there, and I'm not going to try and repeat everybody's criticisms and critiques of of the Bible. There's plenty of people out there. In fact, one group, a real good group that deals with it, a Mythicist Milwaukee. A little shout out to those guys up there. Mythicist Milwaukee deals a lot with, and they have a ton of information on their critiques and issues with the Bible. There's plenty of that stuff available. Let's just drop it down and suffice it to say that the Bible as we have it today is full of contradictions. It's full of Bronze Age assumptions about the world and also the flora and fauna in the world or on the world. There are miscategorizations of animals and plants. You have 
uh, even questions about the, uh, the the concepts of who certain people were within the story. And, and I think the thing that really troubled me the most when I first started to really, really delve into the Bible was how much of it actually has a, a, a subtext, another story that's going on that's never talked about. And it's never really revealed. And that is, is that the Bible, especially the Old Testament, borrows considerably from ancient texts that existed at the time that are older than the Bible. And that the stories are repeated just in a different frame, a different worldview. It's kind of like, in many ways, the Star Trek story. You have different versions. You have original series, you have Next Generation. At the same time, you've got the business, uh, you know, the uh, uh, outpost one. You have, Star Trek has evolved into a... Uh, yeah, think of it this way. Take your Star Trek stories in all the Star Trek books that have been written and you, you, you put them together in a huge compendium, a library of just Star Trek stories. And this library somehow is preserved for about a 2,000 years. And the United States falls apart the you know there's there's major cataclysmic natural disasters and in a couple thousand years you have people who are hunter gatherers you know trying to live the the best they can in a world that they're rediscovering things and that they know there was an older society and civilization you know much like you know time machine and the guy goes into the future, all right? That kind of thing. You already got my point, I bet, the thinkers out there. What if two, 3,000 years in the future, society's rebuilding itself, and somebody comes across this library, and it's full of all these books about Star Trek? They could very easily become the holy text of those people at that time. And then they would have the problem of reconciling all the various storylines and trying to show that there's consistency between the storylines. And then when did they happen? And how did they happen? And pretty soon out of that, you're going to have several different branches and variations of who believes what, and if human nature stays pretty much the way that it is, at some point, so they're going to they're gonna start fighting over it. As to whose belief in the made-up world is actually true and valid. And if you don't convert, you die. That's pretty much it when it comes to religion, when it comes even to the Christian Bible. We don't know where it came from. We don't know that it actually is divinely inspired. We know that it's borrowed. We know so much about what it's not. We're not, all, we're not even completely sure what it is. So there's the Bible, sacred text. Now, I'm not going to criticize everybody's religion or any, anything like that, but I'm talking about that we have looked at and studied these religions. And the sacred and, and many of the religions have multiple sacred texts and the, you you have you have to look at such as in uh hinduism a good example is the vedas and the uh upanishads and you also have the when you get into the stories especially in hinduism you got the uh bhagavita you have the mahabharata of you have a lot of ancient books and and if there's anything around that may have some validity 
of at least describing things that they tried to describe it the best way they could at the time, the Hindu writings and the Sumerian writings are probably the the best to look at that. Now, I know uh, ancient astronaut theory and um, often what's called a, a astral theology. All right, this is the end of part one of the one through four reasons. We'll pick this back up next time, dealing with astral theology and continuing on with our discussion of the sacred texts. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you again next time. This is Tim Wingate for the World Union of Deists and the Declaration of Sinlessness. Stick around. We have a couple special offers on the Declaration of Sinlessness, and... Remember, God gave us reason, not religion. You were born sinless. Your true freedom from sin is here. Declare your freedom from the myth of sin with your own personalized declaration of sinlessness and certification of sinlessness from the World Union of Deists now. Free your mind, body, and emotions with the irrefutable 11 reasons of the declaration of sinlessness. Enjoy life again. Live sin-free. No more groveling at the golden altars of revealed religionists who designed an imaginary disease just so they could sell you an imaginary cure. Both your personalized Declaration of Sinlessness and Certification of Sinlessness are printed in full color on high-quality parchment paper shipped in their own black and gold frames ready for immediate display. Help the World Union of Deists spread the light of reason and place your order now. Only $25 plus shipping from the World Union of Deists www.deism.com You'll be glad you did.